how do you define Tourette's? Tourette's is a very interesting uh, condition. It has many different facets to it. Of course, the most common one that we know about is tics. And those are obviously outwardly visible. Patients have all kinds of both external as well as internal experiences with their tics. Mm -hmm. um, but we know that there's more than just tics with that condition. A lot of patients have other comorbidities, whether it's attention deficit disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, or other psychiatric features that go along with the movements and the noises that we know as tics. What causes Tourette's? It's a hard question to answer. Um, it is probably uh, a combination of things that sort of come together in a particular individual that make them sort of manifest with these conditions. We know that there's probably a strong genetic component. There's some new research coming out that uh, relates to environmental exposures, so things maybe that happened with the individual's mother perhaps during pregnancy, uh, other um, mm. kind of psychosocial features that might influence the manifestation. Uh, so it's a very complex disorder in that sense because it's not something we can pin down to just an exact this is what causes it. And what could have happened with the mother? Mm -hmm. So there may be things like uh, maternal illness that was going on, maybe certain exposures, medications that they had taken, things of that nature that um, could uh, somehow affect uh, the child or the um, kind of uh, fetus, I guess, um, in, uh, in the development phases that then can uh, show up later. Um, as tick disorder. So there were higher incidences of things like that in um, some uh, individuals in, in that cohort. So what's going on in the brain of someone with Tourette's syndrome versus what's not? Like, what's going on in my brain or maybe what's not going on that should be that's causing this? Yeah. So it's, the brain is like, you have to think about it like a, a collection of different circuits. And there's different circuits that do different things. So there's all kinds of different brain functions, whether it's what you're seeing, what you're talking about, um, also your movements, um, your ability to concentrate, focus, things like that. So the evidence suggests that there are kind of things that are going wrong within the circuits that are producing movements, and that's how it manifests at ticks, as ticks. But alongside that, there are the adjacent circuits that are involved in some of the other psychiatric manifestations. And that's why we think that there might be also these comorbidities, um, such as the ADHD and the OCD. Ah, which often are coupled with Tourette's. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think I got both too. ADD yeah. and OCD. Common, yeah. And, over 60% yeah. of individuals have at least one of those. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Um, what does a brain scan of a person with Tourette's look like? So I think a routine brain scan is probably going to look pretty unremarkable in an individual with Tourette's. Okay. If you go look at groups of individuals and try to really look at the parts of the brain that we know are likely to be involved in this circuitry, for example, you might see changes like atrophy, which is uh, you know, just a fancy way of saying a little bit of shrinkage in, in certain areas. So the size of these regions that are involved in those circuits might be uh, different uh, mm. at a group level. But hard to see on an individual level if you just go do a routine uh, CAT scan. Or are we more smart? Are we less smart? I mean, does it affect intelligence? Uh, the evidence does not suggest that it affects intelligence. And in fact, there's uh, quite a lot of individuals with Tourette's who do just fine and, and function quite normally intellectually in life. And well, I'd say most, no? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right about that. And so um, no reason to think that it will impact them adversely or negatively in that way, but it's just the other challenges that come along with uh, the ticks themselves that might delay how these individuals progress through life. I wonder how many people are walking around just undiagnosed. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. It always uh, amazes me when I go into large public spaces, like in an airport or something, um, and you see a lot of different people from lots of different backgrounds, and there's a lot of people out there who, who have to, same thing if you go into a school and you look at children uh, around you, there may be multiple that have. There's no, there's no blood test or brain test, which is like, ding, 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 you have it. I mean, yeah. is, it, is a diagnosis essentially subjective on the part of the doctor? So. It is um, a diagnosis that we have to have an index of suspicion for. So there, you're absolutely right. There isn't going to be just a formula, oh, if it sounds like this, then do these tests right. and you'll prove it. Right. So we use what's called the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which basically tells us the combinations of symptoms and how long they need to be present in order to be able to make the diagnosis of tics or Tourette syndrome. But really to understand whether somebody has tics, you have to understand a little bit about the phenomenology and kind of know how to ask those questions. So generally speaking, tics are noises, they're movements, 
can be in any different body region. Often patients will be able to describe that there's an urge to do it before, some kind of uncomfortable sensation, and they feel like they maybe have to perform it, perhaps even perform it in a certain way, a certain number of times. Um, and so this kind of association between the urge to make the movement followed by the movement is very characteristic of tics. So we use that in our kind of diagnosis to be able to have some confidence that that's actually a tic versus another kind of movement disorder. Other mm. features of tics are that they're suppressible and people can uh, maybe not manifest them during certain times of day or under certain circumstances, maybe be able to even hold them in. Um, other features are maybe that even after a period of holding it in that they may come out in more intensity or with greater force. Um, so there's a lot of these dynamics that we use in our history taking to really identify, okay, this is a tick. And then if it meets certain criteria, then we can say that this individual has Tourette syndrome. How often in your experience does a patient have a mother or father who also has Tourette's? I would say um, pretty common. And sometimes it is not even recognized uh, by that parent and we might be doing our examination in the room and our history taking and we see the individual's parents over there actually having tics and so we often will bring that to their attention and, and sometimes that's the first time that they've even considered that possibility. How, you know, what percentage of Tourette patients are on medication? I think that's a hard question to answer and the reason is that the medicines that we use to treat tics are not necessarily curative, right? So they're there to help treat the manifestation. So if tics are there and they're problematic, we might use medications. If we consider that the tics are not really interfering or not really uh, disrupting any kind of daily activity or daily routine, an individual might choose not to take a medication. So I think there's a lot of personal preference and choice that goes into that and um, maybe you know, some people may have even tried certain medicines and decided it's not for them. I've not heard of a smoking gun medication that like take that pill and your Tourette's is over. Does that exist? So I think that there are medicines that patients commonly respond to, but you're right that it's not going to be the same for every individual. So some patients may respond really well to one or another medication. And so we have kind of a, a group of medicines that we know can be helpful and we may choose one over the other in an individual patient because of certain patient characteristics that might indicate to us that they could respond well to that type of a treatment. You know, so for example, there's some mild medicines, but if you have really bad tics, you may not expect those to really help a whole lot, right? So we can choose a little bit between the options that we have. But you're right, not a smoking gun, not a absolute, everybody should take this because this works every time like a charm in every patient. When I was diagnosed at the age of six, the doctor put me on blood pressure medication? Mm -hmm. Clonidine. I kind of resent because mm -hmm. I don't know why you put a six-year-old on blood pressure medication. It seems profoundly irresponsible to me because it led me to have a very difficult childhood. Yeah. Focusing, connecting in school, staying awake. I mean, I had to repeat the fifth grade because I slept through most of fifth grade. Yeah. So, you know, many of these medicines are, um, you know, well, any medicine really can have risks and it can have benefits. And it's all about finding the right risk benefit ratio. Um, some patients may take medications like the one you're describing without any side effects at all. And others may really suffer from those kinds of issues like falling asleep or not being able to pay attention or, or things like that. Is blood pressure medication <laughs> still used to treat Tourette's? Yeah, so clonidine I think is the one that you're referring yeah, to yeah. and that is um, a commonly mm -hmm. used medication actually. I would put it in the category of medicines that are relatively mild compared to the other options. Again, mild is a relative term, right? Because if it's causing a lot of side effects, or it may not be mild at all. Yeah. With no high blood pressure. So, you know, medicines are sometimes used in different contexts for different reasons, right? So as an adult, um, somebody may prescribe a medicine like that to treat high blood pressure, but you're absolutely right, that's not the intended effect right. in a youngster. And certainly, even in a youngster with high blood pressure, you might not even use that medication. But along the way, we know because of the chemical properties of those medications, they can have an effect on tick. And we do know that clonidine for many patients can be helpful. Um, but I think, as with anything, you have to try, you have to be vigilant about those side effects, and if they're really causing more problems than they're helping, then maybe it's time to move on to something else. What are some of the most common, mis what are some of the most common misconceptions about Tourette's? 
I think some of the things that we hear a lot are, you know, things like why can't you hold it in, or it looks like there are certain situations where you don't have the tick, so it must be something that you're doing on purpose. Right. And I think patients really struggle uh, a lot with that. I think also um, the misperception that it's all about swearing and you know doing kind of inappropriate behaviors, which may affect some individuals with ticks and Tourette's, but not everybody. And so that doesn't necessarily mean um, just because you have this diagnosis that it's going to manifest in that way. I think those are some of the two most common uh, misconceptions that, that are out there. But as a doctor, based on your experience, what's the most common type of Tourette patient case? So I think that's also a hard question to answer, right? Because it's not the same for everybody. Right. I think it never sort of ceases to amaze me like why the brain would think of making a person have this kind of a tick versus that kind of a tick. I think some classic ticks are things like blinking, sniffing, throat clearing, shoulder shrugging, head movements. We know that when ticks start, they often start kind of in the upper body region, but eventually as time goes on, they may spread to other body parts, including the arms and the legs, and there may be much more complexity to the movements that patients make. But I think that there's no way to predict an individual's course. So some people may just have these mild blink, sniff, throat clearing kind of tics, and that's all they ever have. Others may progress and develop that whole sort of uh, complex phenomenology, which starting at the beginning, there's no way for us to sit here and predict that that's the course that it's, that it's going to have. We do have different kinds of medications. We have non-pharmacologic treatments that can be helpful for individuals. It's just a matter of getting them plugged into the right resources and the right treatment options to be able to help them get through that. And many patients are able to get through those rough times and go on to live very uh, happy and successful lives. Does Tourette's lead to other diseases later in life? So not necessarily. I think that the um, dynamics are that while it may seem like it's just a lot of ticks and there's movements and there's noises and this kind of thing, there's those other sort of behavioral things that are going on uh, in uh, the background like the OCD and the ADHD. And sometimes what ends up happening for these individuals is that in those late teenage years the ticks might get better, but then they're still left with some of these other comorbidities. And that could be any number of different things. I've mentioned OCD and ADHD a couple of times, but it could be uh, uh, other issues like depression, anxiety, uh, other uh, of those comorbidities may persist in those individuals. For most people, as they age, do the ticks lessen? I think the vast majority of people will experience some degree of improvement in the mid to late teenage years and in early adulthood. There are certainly going to be a full range of different you know, kind of long-term outcomes, but the majority will either go experience substantial improvement or, or actually even have their ticks go away. Um, there is, um, and, and there are certain circumstances where they may re-manifest later in life. Um, and usually if we're seeing an adult patient who's coming in for the first time for an evaluation for their ticks, the first question we always want to know is, did you have these as a child? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the answer is yes, and it's just a resurfacing of the things that had been present previously. So that kind of a dynamic can occur. We don't have great statistics on how often that occurs, but I would say that that's also probably not the majority of patients. Uh, some people may have heard of Tourette's where someone curses uncontrollably. Mm -hmm. That is a real legitimate thing, is it not? That is a real legitimate thing. What's yeah. it called? It's called coprolalia. And how is that treated? So coprolalia is treated similarly to other ticks. So we can see improvements in that particular symptom with any of the other medications that we would prescribe for other ticks as well. Uh, for those individuals where the coprolalia is particularly difficult to treat or maybe doesn't respond to those medications, we can use botulinum toxin injections into the vocal cords and that can be helpful. What's that? So Botox you've heard of, yeah. maybe for wrinkles and things like that. Yeah. Um, it was originally developed as a muscle relaxer. And sometimes what can happen when individuals are experiencing tics, we could certainly um, reduce the activity of those muscles with the Botox. Um, or botulinum toxin, but there are probably other ways that that treatment can work, and we can do it in places not other than just the vocal cords. So for example, I'll do botulinum toxin injections for patients who have blinking tics, 
uh, also for the ones who have very strong neck jerking ticks. We call that sometimes a whiplash tick when that can be dangerous for individuals as well. So botulinum toxin can be helpful, helpful in those situations, not only and, and probably not specifically as a muscle relaxer, but we know that it can also help suppress that urge. And so there's this complex way that the brain will then get the feedback from these botulinum toxin injections to reduce the intensity of that kind of need uh, to make those movements or noises. But putting the Botox in the vocal cords for a coprolalia patient mm -hmm. who curses, like that helps them not curse? So I think that one is a little bit more complicated and it may be more likely related to making uh, less noise and less sound. Uh -huh. So I think it can be variable in terms of how it works, but uh -huh. I think there definitely are those two components. In the coprolalia cases, what is going through someone's head when they're cursing? Do they know it? Can they stop it? So I think like many ticks, individuals who experience coprolalia probably also do have some degree of an urge. Sometimes that urge is easier to control than others. And I think that that's where sometimes people run into trouble. Like if it's just a really intense urge and you're trying as best as you can to manage it or maybe to transform it into some other kind of noise or, or movement, um, sometimes that's easier to do and sometimes it's not. So I think that um, there may be kind of an indication that this is about to happen and, and people will try their hardest, uh, but it may not always be possible. To be clear, for a lot of patients with Tourette's, these are involuntary tics. They're involuntary. Uh, they're sometimes referred to as semi-voluntary because there is that level of urge and suppression and things like that associated with it, but fundamentally there is something going on in the brains of these individuals that is making them feel like they have to and their level of controlling it is not um, usual, right? And so rather than being able to just say, I'm not gonna make that movement, these things will come out. I think for many people, there are medicines that can work and sometimes it's just a matter of, of finding it. And I kind of talk about medicines in three different levels. There's kind of like the mild medicines, there's the middle level medicines, and then there's kind of the big gun medications. And so we have this kind of range of options that we can work with. Yeah. Um, for non-medication treatments, there is something called cognitive behavioral intervention for tics. And this is a course of therapy that people can go through and they work closely with a psychologist mm -hmm. or sometimes other trained health professionals mm. to really work on understanding these dynamics that we've talked about. So what's the cycle that produces the tick? What's the urge? How do you kind of tell that a tick is about to happen? What are some circumstances around you that are more likely to provoke those feelings? And then what can you do to manage it, to control it, to transform it, maybe do something less disruptive? So there's a component of education in there, and then there's also a component of habit reversal mm, where people are learning to do things that are less uh, obvious, less disruptive, less problematic in one way or another. And then I think for some of the more severe cases, people may have heard about things like deep brain stimulation, surgical therapies. Yeah. Uh, and that's still an emerging area of treatment. Uh, it's not for everybody. What I happens think. there? Yeah, so deep brain stimulation is kind of like a pacemaker. So you have a battery, it's placed in the chest, but rather than the battery being connected to wires that go to your heart, the wires actually go into the deep brain structures that are involved in that circuitry that I was talking about uh, that produce the ticks. So these movement circuits in the brain, we can place electrodes in there. Hmm. We can provide a little bit of electricity to kind of reset that circuit a little bit. Hmm. And for some individuals who have these really kind of otherwise difficult co to control ticks, this may be an effective way to get some relief. Usually these stimulators are on 24-7 mm -hmm. and we set it at a certain rate and it provides this continuous stimulation and so hopefully continuous what's happening... Continuous stimulation? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. And so what's hopefully happening is that these circuits, like I said, are getting a little bit reset to a more kind of physiologic or normal way of functioning and reducing that tick activity. What happens if it mm -hmm. overstimulates? What does that look like? Yeah. Overstimulation certainly is possible if we set it too high. For example, people may have different side effects and some of those side effects may depend on where in the brain we have 
provided that stimulation, so certain regions are close to structures that uh, create different kinds of movements, and if we recruit those areas, then people may have tightening or stiffening sensations. Some people may have uh, double vision or blurry vision as a consequence of the stimulation, but usually we can just turn that down and it uh, resolves. And if it works right, then you basically just control it to where you really don't have the ticking. Right, or at least markedly reduce ticks. Wow. And patients don't even know that the stimulator is there or that the stimulation is on. Now, how many patients are actually being treated with that? Not very many, yeah. yeah. It's an emerging therapy. It's really reserved for those patients who have tried all the other usual things that we've talked about. And if they really can't get the relief there and they're really impaired because of their Tourette's or their ticks, then we may talk about this. Tourette's is not a terminal illness? It is not a terminal illness. For some, it may be life altering. Yes. Has it ever been, in your opinion, an experience life-threatening? Yes. That whiplash tick, there are reports where patients have gotten spinal cord injuries because of the severity of their neck ticks. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Are most cases like mine mild? So I would say that um, probably a typical course would be somebody who, and, and I don't know if this is your story, so um, I'll just maybe walk through it a little bit, but somebody may start having tics, maybe some of the OCD and ADHD at a young age, let's say five or six years old. Those may kind of intensify. The worst ever time period might be the 10 to 12 year old range. That's what our research suggests. And if you ask patients, that's often what they'll hmm. uh, endorse. And then after that, there's a period where it kind of starts improving, and then by the late kind of uh, in, into those teenage years is when we start seeing people really experience that improvement. And so that, I think, would be a typical course. And of course, there's all kinds of variations on that theme, um, but that's what we generally consider the natural history. It's funny because for me, I would say six to 12 was awful. Yeah. And then like, Round about 30 on, I started to pick up some new things. Yeah. I was like, I thought I left that in my 20s, in yeah. my teens. Yeah. Yeah, and I think those are certainly situations that we see in, in different, for, maybe for different reasons. Um, I don't know that we have an exact handle on why the coming back part actually happens. Sometimes it'll happen in the context of big life changes, maybe stressors. Uh, yes. Things like that. Yeah, so there are um, actually some medicines that are really kind of on the verge of potentially being available for individuals with Tourette's. They have slightly different mechanisms of action. And so for um, you know, some people who have uh, problematic tics, like we talked about, finding the right medicine that gives them the relief that they're looking for without side effects uh, is challenging. So it's really exciting to have some of these new uh, medication options available. So one of them is working on the dopamine system in the brain, but working on it in a very different way than what we typically would uh, use, um, which are dopamine receptor blockers, also known as antipsychotic medications. And that one looks promising. It should be um, going through further investigation and, and potentially coming out um, to market uh, in the coming years. Um, there's a whole new kind of line of investigation going on in terms of supplements, actually. Um, and this is still emerging, um, but they are also showing evidence of promise in, in treating supplements? and reducing ticks. So some of them are actually Chinese herbal supplements.